skies smiling at me nothing but blue skies do I see blue birds singing a song nothing but blue birds all day long never saw the sun shining so I seem to spend half my damn life at the doctor's. They keep telling me I'm hunky-dory for my age, as it were. One of the braver ones suggested I drink too much. He won't be suggesting that anymore. I mean to say, what's life without a glass or two of red? <laughs> she looks after me best she can. Esther, I mean. She and our housekeeper, the ransom woman, too well at times, treat me like an invalid. Damned irritating. I used to be as fit as a fiddle. Oh, yes. And I cannot abide today's young men, a scruffy bunch of weaklings. I see them at the school gate with their heads stuck in their electronic devices. I hate to think what they'll be like when they get to my age. It is true, I do struggle to catch my breath sometimes. But that's to be expected, all things considered. Yes. I like to think I can still turn a few pretty young heads. Often I can sense Esther giving me one of her hidden looks to remind herself of what a fine figure of a man I am. Lady Esther, they look down. Lovely little she is. Yet me to get where my wife died. She'd been a while in time if she hadn't been here to pick up a people. He had a bad cough, you see, and she felt sorry for him. Put the scar for keeping warm during the cold spell we were having. The Major's always telling us how he went through military training and how he can put up with most things. But to be honest, he's always ailing. Mind you, he does a fair bit of walking, but oh my goodness, how he coughs and wheezes. That's like listening to a pair of leaky old bellows. Up real early he is and straight into his office. Then later in the evening, he's back there again. Even eats his meals up there. He never lets no one pass the door. I often wonder what he finds to occupy his mind. But still, that's one less room for me to clean. He's dead picky about stupid little things as the Major. The strangest thing about him is that he has some kind of phobia about colours. Blue mostly. Very strange. We have this gardener chap here. Uh, he's getting on a bit now, but that's no excuse for laziness or slipshod work. My wife's too soft with him. A couple of weeks ago, she saw him struggling along with the wheelbarrow. Now, I have to admit, the wheel is a bit dodgy and Sometimes, unexpectedly, just to have to, uh, as you have it rolled along nicely, it jams and sets your arse over tip under the well. Well, Dexter, that's him, the gardener, did just that. Despite the fact that I have warned him several times before. And so, unlike my wife, I had no sympathy when he fell into the fish pond. In fact, after Esther had yanked him out, I blew my proverbial top. <laughs> In the early days, they used to have lots of people working here. They were a cook, as well as an housekeeper, and a scholarly lady who did the secretarial work. Oh, and a young lad who looked after the estate. 
took an handyman. Some of it were real heavy stuff, mainly machinery in there, as well as sorting out and fencing. Her ladyship, you were always kind to that young man. She said he was good to talk to and handsome and always willing. She often accompanied him walking the dog. What miles they did, must have done going by the time they were out. <laughs> Not anymore. There's only me and Mrs. Ransom now. I like to think I'm a tolerant sort of chap. But there's one thing I'm particular about, and that's colours. I know it sounds petty, but when I see things badly coloured, I get most annoyed. Like, like people who own yellow cars. And idiots. And have you seen the colour some people paint their houses? I passed one the other day, white in the centre of the village, painted sky blue. Yes, sky blue. Beggar's belief. She has a wry sense of humour as Lady Esther. Nearly splits her sides telling me and Dexter about the things she got up to at the all-girls boarding school she went to. She reckons they didn't teach her much, but she's a good cook thanks to them. Good job too now, cook's gone. Most days she makes lunch for me and Dexter. Wonderful thing she concocts. It gives the three of us the chance to have a good old chinwag in the kitchen, away from his wood. Mrs. Ransom, she likes to gather bits and pieces from the fields and hedgerows to make herbal medicines. So if any of us gets ill, she orders something for us to take. But why heck it always works? Not him, of course. He calls it stuff and nonsense. So we let him suffer. His office is up on, in the attic where he has a good view of the surrounding countryside and a village. You can see right down the oil street from his window, so there's no nicking off down the pub for a quick lunchtime drink. This office is my inner sanctum, and I won't have my privacy violated for any reason. The things I keep here are for my eyes and my eyes only. Oh, and I insist on cleaning it myself, despite their protestations. I tell them over and over. I'm a military man, used to keeping things tidy and won't be tired anyone who dares to break my walls. But luckily, he has a good lock. And at ten o'clock, sharp, I turn the key, have a cold shower and take to my bed. Military training, you see. Major's got a temper on him. In fact, he never were a patient man, and his use of language can be a bit, well, blue. And then there's the drink. That never improves his mood, and he can get obnoxious. You should hear the names he calls poor old Dexter sometimes. But Lady Esther, on the other hand, never has a bad word for anyone. And she's always busy. Mostly in the village visiting sick or lonely people, or at WI meetings, or up at the school where she's a governor. Not long ago, her ladyship took over the local village drama group. They meet at the school of an evening. You can just see the entrance from the driveway, so she ain't part of cycle. Every morning and every afternoon there's a steady trickle of young people walking through those school gates. 
much to the disgruntle of the Major, who watches them closely from his office window to make sure they don't get up to no mischief, so he said. Thankfully, he spends most of his time up there, or he's out in the woods with his binoculars, Always has him hanging round his neck, yes. Goodness knows what he gets up to. We never ask. But when he gets back, he always rigs the whiskey. I, I have this dreadful sore throat. I've taken copious amounts of whiskey and honey, but nothing seems to get rid of it. Of course, Esther fusses round, suggesting this and that. A bloody woman, as if I wasn't suffering enough. I told her I will not take one of Mrs. Wansom's damn remedies. So stop rabbiting on about it and find something that will take away the pain. Do you know what she did? She knitted me a scarf. A damn scarf to keep my neck warm. And a blue one to boot. Blue! Stupid bloody woman. Lady Esther, bless her, is always trying to get me to join her drama club. She reckons most of them are widows like me. But I told her it were all right for her, she were used to it. I wouldn't dare get up and speak in front of a load of staring eyes. Apparently there used to be a lot of gentlemen members, but most of them are pushing up the daisies now. One of them who'd been their leading man for years was diagnosed with some form of dementia and could no longer remember his lines. And she tells me that Mr Sotheby, who used to have the antique shop, took over from him. The vicar was going to do it, but he left after an incident with the new lady school teacher and one of his own maid sausages. The manor house? Ain't far outside the village. You often see her ladyship riding down the road on her bike. I would never tell him, but I have seen her on more than one occasion getting a lift home in Mr. Sullivan's car. She throws her bike in the back, you see. And they sit browsed down by the church. Talking, I expect. Or going through line for their next production. He's nice, Mr. Sotheby, a proper gent. Always speaks well of folk. But she was telling me how lonely he gets living on his own now as his wife has passed away. The scarf turned out really well. A bit too long, perhaps, but lovely colours. He didn't like it. He only ever wore it once. I suggested to Lady Esther that one of my herbal remedies might help with the Major's throat infection, so I made him one. A mixture of dried juniper leaves, sage and nettles. Oh, and a sprinkling of birch tree bark that I gathered in the wood. It has an evil smell and it tastes terrible it do. And she said he'd not touch it. But I knew he would. Right. He said, meek as a lamb, that as I'd gone to the bother of bringing him some, he'd take it. That did surprise Lady Esther, but not me. I knew it were because of what happened. <laughs> I couldn't survive without my daily sorties. There's a small gamekeeper's hut, all long forgotten and hidden, deep among the trees where I sit most afternoons and reflect on life. And all the years I've been going there, I have never been bothered by unwanted visitors. 
However, one day, completely out of the blue, Mrs. Ranson strayed by with her basket, picking bits and pieces for one of her evil brews. Well, I thought it would normally have taken this very badly. But she's a hardy peasant sock, and despite the cold, she wore only a shawl over her flimsy clothing and had no idea I was watching her. Well, suddenly the, the heavens opened up and the rain poured down in torrents. Well, within seconds, she was drenched to the skin and shivering with cold. So, well, what was I to do? I drew back the curtains, opened the door and called to her to take shelter. And then, being a gentleman, I threw more logs on the fire to dry her out. I stripped off her wet clothing. Well, one thing led to another. <laughs> but, you know, I think she felt ashamed afterwards. Well, I insisted we keep the incident to ourselves. And I can, well, I can be very persuasive. Yet you have no idea what lengths I had to go in order to ensure the silly woman's silence. Despite the fact that it was her reputation as well as my own that I wished to protect. <laughs> Except for birthdays and Christmas, I've never seen him buy her ladyship presents. But one day after one of his rare trips out in the car, he came back with our great arm for the beautiful lilies. They were well out of season, he must have cost him a fortune. I noticed he went to kiss her. Something I'd never seen him do before. And at last minute he changed his mind. My wife knows nothing of the incident with Mrs. Ransom, or well, at least I, I don't think she does, but because of their propensity for tete-a-tetes, I decided it would be prudent if I made an effort to be nicer than usual, just in case something had been said. I even agreed to take some of the damn woman's awful medicine. She'd asked him many times to get the gazebo floor and seen to, but he always shouted at her, saying it were a waste of good money. So, it seemed surprising when he suddenly decided he was going to fix it himself. If only it were his conscience. I became aware that Esther and Mrs. Ransom seemed to be talking to each other more than usual, and because of the incident in the gamekeeper's hut, I felt I should err on the side of caution. Now, I knew Esther had been called off guard when I bought the flowers, and so I thought I'd follow this up by offering to repair the loose floorboards in the old gazebo. This would certainly put her off the scent. She'd been on at me for years about it, but I'd always felt it was totally unnecessary considering it was used primarily for storage. Now, I still had the tools left by the young handyman, and so, armed with his powerful drill, good stout hammer, nails, screws, and hefty screwdriver, I motioned to Esther to follow me, and I set off across the garden. Mrs. Ransom and me were talking down by the potting shed. She was telling me as how Mr. Sullivan were popping in for lunch when we saw Major Noble struggling across the lawn with Lady Esther following him. Mrs. Ransom commented on how clumsy he looked carrying an enormous bag of tools. She said, who would have thought that such a virile young man with a 
firm, muscular body with an attractive blonde hair, would have turned into this balding, corpulent, bad tempered little rat of a man. What do you think, man? Had he always been so obnoxious? Do you know? I reckon he had. Aware that the three of them were walking behind me, and to further please Esther, I paused, put down my bag, and took out the abominable blue scarf she'd made me, and gritted my teeth, and wound it tightly round my neck. I could sense she was pleased. When her ladyship saw us, she signalled for us to follow her, and we did. She were a little surprised to see him put on her scarf, but I knew why he put it on. Once inside, I pushed some of the lumber to one side, slipped to my thick leather glove, knelt down, winced at the cracking noise my knees made, and proceeded to nail down the offending board. But as I worked, the dust rose up and brought on a bout of coughing. And to make matters worse, there was little room to swing the hammer. But despite these setbacks, I ploughed on. But it soon became apparent that nails would not do the job, and so I decided screws would be needed. I congratulated myself on being prepared for this, and after carefully selecting the appropriate size bits, I commenced drilling holes, ready to take the screws. I was very proud of this powerful drill. It had everything. Hammer effect, numerous speed settings, and even a trigger lock. A real man's tool. I worked non-stop. No, they stood behind me, watching in admiration. The three of us stood in that cramped space, watching. We all knew he wanted us to be there, wanting us to be impressed by how this aging ex-army officer still had the capacity to get down on his knees and, as he said, damn well fix the floorboards once and for all. He wanted us to understand that despite his age, he was still a fit man, still someone to look up to. If only he knew how much we despised him. When the blue scarf she'd made him, the blue scarf he hated so much, the blue scarf he reckoned he was never going to wear, became entangled in the drill and grew ever tighter round his throat, he was transfixed. Major Noble, the man who could do everything. Major Noble, the man who were always right. Major Noble. The man who had fought himself on Mrs. Ransom in the woods and thought she would never tell and was being slowly strangled to death. He hated the blue scarf. He hated blue. Yet his face was slowly turning that very colour. When he realised his gloves were stopping him turning off the trigger lock and that he couldn't reach the wall socket for the piles of furniture, he reached out his arms and gave an urgent gurgling sound. For a second we did nothing. Then her ladyship smiled and motioned for us to leave. After carefully closing the gazebo door, the three of us walked arm in arm across the lawn, back to the house. To one of her ladyship's Wonderful lunches with Mr. Sutherford. Blue skies smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see.